all these things point to the most massive over leveraged triumvirate of bubbles we've ever had. We still have a hawkish Fed, so please don't misunderstand what I've said so far. I'm saying that I'm not a perma bear, but we still have a lot of downside yet to come, in my opinion. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with money manager Michael Pento. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Michael, in which he explains why he thinks stocks can drop 30 to 50 percent or more over the coming year, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. And Michael also kindly shares the portfolio allocation that he thinks will weather the coming storm best. So be sure to stick around to hear that. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Michael Pento. All right, um, now to the, to the key discussion here, the main event, which is, okay, you're in that office every day because this is an unfolding situation and there are um, sort of, you know, different different playbooks that you may deploy depending upon what happens here, right? You know, when does it look like Powell's going to pivot? What's inflation doing at that time? You're, you're really going to have to keep a lot of things in mind. But in the here and now, you have to manage client capital. Um, and first off, uh, let, let me just ask, um, uh, it's been a rough year right, for all capital managers, because pretty much just about every asset has gone down, right? It's been one of the worst years on record for both stocks and bonds combined. Um, how, how has your portfolio uh, fared on a relative basis? So this year, we're, we're down low single digits. Um, and the reason for that is because three of the four horsemen of the economic apocalypse are working, dollar shorts and cash, bonds that we own, we no longer own long duration treasuries, we'll probably get back in that trade um, tomorrow, depending on the CPI print, but um, we still own a lot of short duration U.S. treasuries, but they've not, not, not that they haven't worked for anybody. They actually have hurt you severely if you own them. We owned a very small position of them, but 30% is your down on long duration treasury. Well, I don't need yield curve. You go to zeros, you bought TLT or anything long duration. So 20 years plus or zeros, which is even longer. Um, You've got, you're down 30%. You're down more than the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ's down 30-something percent. <laughs> but you're down more in the, the safest, risk-free asset known yeah. to man. You're down more than the NASDAQ. I call it the NASDAQ crap. The NASDAQ, okay? <laughs> so so that, that, that speaks volume. So if you're only down low single digits, I, you know, I, my, many people would die to be down that much. But um, I, I, I'm basically uh, unhappy with that because I wanna make money during bear markets. Very hard to do up till this point, but I think the next phase, the phase two of this market decline, phase one was just a revaluation of the PE ratio. P, you know, the price to earnings ratio coming down from 22 to 18, 15, 16, whatever, one, whatever forward earnings you wanna use. Wall Street always talks about forward earnings because they don't like to use TTM trailing mm -hmm. 12 months because it makes it look a little bit worse. But um, I, I really feel that the next phase is going to involve a steep recession, which has always been bullish for bonds. I have one caveat for that. So why, why haven't bonds worked? So we have disinflation, we have recession, we have a very weak economy. Why haven't bonds worked? First of all, and, and they're like they've worked, worked every other time. Two, two reasons here. Number one, maybe three. So stubbornly high inflation. So even though inflation, we have disinflation, it's coming down from a very high level, it's coming down very slowly. Number two is quantitative tightening. We've never actually drained uh, hundreds of billions out of the dollars out of the Fed's balance sheet before, only one time in the past. And we've never done it this rapidly. It's causing a lot of liquidity, liquidity problems in the treasury market. And I think, you know, as a dealer, if you get into trouble, and you're, you're, you know, you're short on inventory, you have some sell orders, you can't take the other side. You, you, you're prone to spikes in yields, especially as you got as convexity kicks in long duration bonds. And, and the third reason is Japan. So Japan, which is a, a, a train wreck of a, a retirement village, um, they have you know, a quadrillion yen in debt. They peg their 10 year note at a quarter of 1%. And what they're doing is they're, they're, fa they're faced with a huge dilemma. Their currency was crashing. 
So uh, they could either stop printing money and buying JGBs, or what they could do is allow is break that cap on the on the ten year note and allow interest rates to skyrocket and bring the insolvent nation bankrupt. That, that that's the, their choices. But there's a third choice which they decided to opt for, which is they could start unwinding their massive currency reserves, which they hold in dollars, which dot which are held in treasuries. So they're selling treasuries, selling dollars to re, to buy back their currency to support it. That's what they're doing. So that's those are three reasons why. Treasuries might still work, but they're not going to be the, especially as you go out along the yield curve, as powerful as they've been in the past. Okay, got it. And and I mean, each one of those may be transitory, right? Um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen with inflation, but certainly the game plan right now is to bring CPI down, right? And and the reason why that's been hard on bonds with CPI being as high as it is is because the the real return on bonds is negative right. when inflation is super high. And so bond investors are like, well, why would I lock in a, a real negative loss for myself, right? It just makes bonds look less attractive. But the playbook that we've been talking about here is Powell is super focused on getting that number down. We also think organically the, the natural deflationary forces are gonna help there. Um, uh, the Japan one, uh, I mean, I guess that ends, <laughs> <laughs> we, we know it at least ends when they run out of treasuries to sell. They're probably not going to run to zero. Do you see yeah. that selling abating uh, any time in the near future? The, the best way I know, of, one of the best ways in the world that I know of to destroy your currency is to just wipe out your currency reserve. Yeah. So they, they had over a trillion and they're taking it down below that. It's hard to get the exact numbers because there's price depreciation there too. Um, and there's, there's currency uh, fluctuations as well. But um, if they continue to try to support their yen by dumping their currency reserves, that's going to just lead to a big problem down the, down the road. So I, it's limited in duration for sure. They have to eventually they're going to have to decide do they want their currency to get wiped out anyway, <laughs> or just you know raise that level, that cap at the quarter of one a quarter of one percent on their duration bonds, and that if they were to do that, that would drag up yields across the world. That's not going to be positive for treasuries in the short run either. So you have to watch, you know, that's why I say you have to be there every day watching when is the good entry point entry point for long duration bonds. It's going to be tricky, but it's I think it's coming. Okay. And I want to I want to dig into that with you. Um, just to mm -hmm. complete the three things you talked about. The the third one was QT. And and we are doing QT <clears throat> right now. Um, at some point though, it sounds like from what you said earlier you expect the Fed's going to have to pivot at some point. And at that point, I would imagine you would think they would at least pause or stop QT, correct? Yeah, yeah. that's going to happen, yes. Or even flip back into QE. Okay. Um, so, you know, so bonds, bond, we've talked a bit about it on this program, you know, the the, long, the sovereign bonds um, are, are looking interesting. Right? I, don't, I don't want to lead in, any viewers here, but but they're looking pretty interesting right now. One, because there finally is an alternative to owning speculative equities, right? Where you can now get a return in bonds, right? Still a negative return as measured by CPI, but as we said, CPI is coming down and bond yields are rising. So that, that's narrowing. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, banks aren't rewarding you at all for savings right now. So there's <laughs> de definitely the, a pretty compelling where, reason just to- Adam, where's the OTC? Where's the Office of Thrift, Thrift Supervision, OTS? Where's the OCC office? What do they do? I mean, they should knock on Wells Fargo and say, hey, listen, what are you doing? I, I have a lot of money in that bank and they're giving me 0.01% still. How is that legal? How is that? I, I don't know. I was going to ask you the same question. <laughs> and of course, you know, they're getting paid uh, a much, much higher rate on their interest on their excess reserves. And they are sharing absolutely none of that with the consumer. Hey, pull your pull your money out of the bank and and buy short term treasuries. You know, short term treasuries are yielding the close to you know over four percent. The inversion is is the worst it's been in forty years, as I mentioned. So just buy short term treasuries, you get a real yield. Risks. So I, I I actually have been mentioning that both on this program and on Twitter right now. Yeah, rather than just keeping it in a bank, just put it in a in a short-term treasury and just keep rolling it over. And as rates go up, you know, you're riding that up. And if uh, things ever reverse, you know, you just wait a month or three months and you get your money back and you put it wherever you want to put it, right? 
So, Michael, I can make a good argument for why capital um, should be flowing back in, in, into bonds now. Um, one, because there is an alternative, right? There is a yield that's, that's being offered. Um, and uh, one, you know, equities are on a relative basis performing poorly. And you just gave a good reason a few minutes ago why we can make an argument that they're probably going to go lower next year. Um, but then you also sort of have the whole dollar milkshake theory from Brent Johnson, right, which is um, capital around the rest of the world uh, is getting pretty abused right now. And they're likely to still have a the lumps that we take here in the US, they're still likely going to take worse than we. Yep. Um, and so, you know, if things really start getting rickety. So, so that capital is going to be moving into US markets in general, just trying to find, you know, better treatment. But if we get something that forces a Fed pivot, you know, on the way there, capital is going to increasingly be looking just for safety, right? And the US Treasury is still, you know, the safest asset around um, in most people's minds. So I can just think of all these different vectors for why capital is going to flow into uh, the Treasury. And of course, if there is a Fed pivot, then there's a whole bunch of people that are going to want to play that, right? Which is, oh, US Treasury, you know, uh, rates are going to come down, the prices should go up. So let's, you know, jump into the long end of the curve here. Yep. So, you know, I'd love your reaction to this. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. I mean, what you know, you know, your calculation goes like this. Should, should I lose 30% of my principal uh, and go, going out to try to buy stocks, you know, go buy, uh, you know, or Bitcoin, use 30% of my principal and then subtract 8% inflation? Or should I make 4% in a risk-free short-term treasury <laughs> and only lose 4% in real terms? Yeah, and sorry to interrupt, Michael, but not only are you getting paid that 4% that you just mentioned, but you have the option value that if interest rates, you know, drop in a pivot or because tons of capital is coming in in a crisis, that your bond could appreciate dramatically. I mean, if, if we get a real pivot where Powell drives rates back down to 2%, 1%, even lower, you know, on the long duration bonds, you could see 20, 30, 40% appreciation, right? Because of convexity, you go out, you know, long duration bonds perform great. And if, on the short duration bonds, you know, if you're still going to make, if you buy a, a three month treasury, uh, and it's, it's, he's going to zero, you're going to, you know, you'll see those prices appreciate and you're still going to co collect the higher yield there. So, but most of your juice will be out along the yield curve, zeros and TLT. Okay. So just to sort of put a bow around this, um, bonds, particularly sovereign bonds, there's, there's different issues with corporate and muni bonds. And if you have anything you want to say about those, Michael, please I, do. I, but it sounds like what you're saying is, is, the planets are beginning to align around sovereign bonds, um, and um, it's just a matter of finding the right entry point here. And I guess we'll say you're watching things closely right now. A absolutely. And, you know, the predicate for every uh, asset class sector and style factor in each of my five sectors of between, you know, disinflation, deflation, recession, and stagflation, hyperinflation, intractable inflation is backtesting. And you look at the backtest every single time we had a global slowdown, the primary beneficiary is the dollar. And it's just a reversal, an unwind of a carry trade, basically. You know, people borrow dollars, lower yielding uh, debt, and they go out and they speculate in, you know, Brazil and China and Russia and India. And then when the world, when the recession comes, they have to unwind that carry trade. They got to sell their assets there, sell their dollar, sell their current local currency and buy back dollars to close out the trade. That's one one of the reasons why you know people say, oh, you know, the yen is this you know a safe haven currency. No, it's not. You know, it's the unwinding of a carry trade. That's that's yeah. it. That's it in a nutshell. Um, but I wanted to say one thing before before we end. Um, two reasons why I think Powell will be will be more reticent to do that actual genuine pivot. Number one, he's looking at um, faulty data and lagging data. Yeah. So you look you look at there were there were. Um, in the in the after the pandemic till today, there were 158 million people in the U.S. workforce right after the pandemic, right before. I'm sorry, right prior to the pandemic. Today, we have 158 million people in the workforce. Um, if you look at the three. So go back to the last to leading up to the Great Recession that, in the housing bubble in the three years prior to the onset of the Great Recession, which was December of 2007, there were 6 million people hired. So if Powell's, if Powell's a labor economist and the rest of the FOMC's labor economists and looking at Phillips curve stuff, 
and they're saying, wait a second, we're, we're, why, why are initial claims still very uh, quiescent? Why aren't they higher? Uh, why aren't we getting massive layoffs yet? They're coming, but they're slower to come because we don't have that excess labor to shed. I, I, wanna, I wanna make that point very clear. Um, the other one is, so you look at credit spreads. Normally Powell will say, you know, you look at the, the spread between treasuries and high yield junk bonds. That spread usually blows out when you're heading into a recession, right? People sell junk bonds, the yields go higher. People buy treasuries, the yields go lower, right? Okay, okay. This, this time it's not happening because yields are going higher on both fronts. And we explain, I explained why. So you're not getting that blowout in the spread. So the spread between junk bonds and treasuries right now is about 4.8. It should be it should be closer to eight at this point, but it's not. So if Powell is just looking at credit spreads and he's looking at the un, the uh, um, the non farm payroll situation, he's get, he's getting more uh, placated, mollified for his actions so far. And then he's looking at lagging data, which is the CPI data. Forty percent of core uh, CPI is owners equivalent rent, and those rents are still going higher. So so look for a pivot. I'm not looking for a pivot tomorrow. I'm looking for a pivot probably in the second quarter of 2023 for those reasons. Okay, yeah, it, which <laughs> classic as we hear a lot, uh, Fed is looking through the rearview mirror here. So it sort of sounds like you feel like they're probably going to hit into the pivot events, you know, at full speed, right? Looking behind himself and he's going to hit into the limit, right? Because he's, he's he's looking looking at old data, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Well, look, a couple of quick questions. Um, about your your the other parts of your portfolio management. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because we we've, we've talked about it in depth in previous um, uh, appearances of yours here on this channel. But you talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We really dialed into bonds this time around. Um, but the other components of that are um, being long the dollar, um, holding a lot of cash, obviously, um, and then being short. Um, is there anything else? Anything you want to say about those other three components? Um, well, I mean, I, I, as again, I'd rather lose a few percentage points in real terms than be down 25, 30%. So I holding cash in a recession is, is the right thing to do, even if it's a, a stagflationary recession, because there's just the, the alternatives are, are, you know, having a, a cash hoard, which you're ready to deploy. And by the way, let me add that second quarter, you might get the, the market plunge way before then and start to price in a recovery before the second quarter hits. Mm -hmm. That could happen. Then you, you have that humongous purchasing power, that cash or ready to deploy in the correct asset classes. And I will say this, I do believe if interest rates are in the process of topping, and that should happen next few weeks and months here, then you might get some other things starting to work too, like gold. You notice a couple of days ago, you had a 10% rally in the, in the miners. And that was followed by another 6% rally because we're getting there. You know, it's, it's sort of like a washout period here for the gold miners. And I've avoided the, the, the big plunge in these in particular, uh, this, uh, these miners, this asset class. But I'm thinking about and getting ready to buy them because I do think you're going to get to a plateau. And even if you get just a plateau in interest rates, these miners could be a buy. So I'm looking at that now. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, all right. So, and, and look, Michael, I, I know you were kind of beating yourself up because you, you you don't like to have a negative performance at all. I mean, what capital manager does? But I long said coming into this year, the strategy, the winning strategy may be to be prepared to lose money. Your goal is just to lose a lot less than everybody else. You seem to be doing a really good job about that. So, Thanks. so kudos. Um, well, and as, um, as uh, I think it's Rick Rule who said it, um, he looks at holding cash in a period like this as, yeah, you're you're paying the inflation tax to be in cash. But he says, I just look at that as my options premium um, to be able to have a call option on buying everything else at a discounted value in the future, right? Which is exactly what you just said. But he said it better than I did. <laughs> Not at all. All right. Well, look, um, the... What are you, what signs will you be monitoring to signal that it's time to start switching from defense to offense? So let's say we are now into the first quarter or two of next year. Um, things are unfolding the way that you think 
you know, they're going to, what are you going to be looking to say, okay, it's time to start getting back into the pool. You just told us, you just gave us a good one for the mining, the yeah. gold mining complex. What other ones would you be looking for? So um, I got 20 components in my model. I'll be looking at credit spreads. Um, I'll be looking at that 10 to treasury spread. I'd like to see, first of all, I'd like to see a, the bulls come back and buy short-term treasury. So the, the spread might initially increase as it usually always does <laughs> but that's your that's your signal that hey the the meat and and the, the teeth of the recession are is happening now powell is indeed either pivoting or about to pivot when you see that happening and that'll be presaged by you'll see a, a, a massive flush of money coming into the short-term uh treasury complex okay um, so sorry to interrupt but you'll want to see those spreads widen or blow out they always but, do but largely because Less because the the high yield yeah. debt yields are going up, but more because the the government debts uh, yields are going down because of all the capital going in there. I think they call that a bull steepener. A so bull you, steepener. Okay. <laughs> you see people run into the short term uh, treasury complex. That's a that's a big clue. Uh, financial conditions index will instead of rising will start to uh, come down. Like I said, I, I'm going to sit here and go over all, all 20 components of my model. The dollar is another signal that I use. Uh, the real Fed funds rate is another thing I use. So uh, this is why I have a model. So I don't, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, gee, I wonder how I feel today. I want, I wonder if, you know, CNBS told me that, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a wonderful bullish sign that um, Zuckerberg lay, is laying off, you know, 11% of his workforce. So that means the bottom, the market's going to bottom. I mean, I have a model of arcane, very specific, well, uh, uh, you know, determined, uh, indicators to let me know what I should be doing. This is how I knew, by the way, I'm not a perma bear. As you know, when I first came on your program in July of 21, I said, Hey, we're long and strong and we're bullish. Yep. But we, I, the, the model was presaging the, the fiscal and monetary tightening that was going to happen in 22, early in 22. And, and then it's, it's right now telling me, Hey, we're getting ready, prepared for the next leg, which could be very, very bullish for certain asset classes of stocks. Um, and maybe even particularly a dividend payers, which would be a wonderful thing for us. So you have retirees actually buying stocks at a great price, fair value, and throwing off a very strong dividend. Wow. You mean like savers and investors can actually get some <laughs> income now on their capital? Well, wouldn't that be refreshing? Wouldn't. Of course, of course. And this is why I don't I don't just say he, you know, here's here's my model. And we're gonna we're say one day this is gonna happen and just stay there. But what if what if Powell does a genuine pivot and goes back into QE and takes and takes and interest rates to zero and starts, you know, buying trillions of dollars of municipal bonds and junk bonds and mortgage-backed securities again? Well, that's going to be highly inflationary. You want to you want to underweight bond and bond proxies there and go out more on the risk curve. Yeah. Hey, maybe you maybe you could even buy Bitcoin again. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody's still around, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't really, it's not my favorite asset class as, as people probably know, because there's an unlimited supply of cryptocurrencies and blockchains that can be created. So it's not gold. Um, but uh, gold, by the way, just to mention that one more time, gold could really shine in 2023. I'm looking forward to that, Adam. Well, from your lips to God's ears on that, and I know a lot of uh, long-suffering um, precious metals holders here who have been wondering why they got the party they had hoped for this year in terms of <laughs> high inflation and yeah. all sorts of things, and yet gold disappointed, right? So because hope, because hope. because it's about real interest rates. People aren't right. gold isn't about anything else but the direction of real interest rates. So is inflation rising faster than nominal yields are rising? Well, that's that would be a fall of real interest rates. But if that's not the case. It's not the case now. You're getting a rise in real interest rates. Gold is a no touch. Okay. All right. Well, Michael, um, two things. One, first, you, you're you're really um, you're you're embodying why on this program we just repeatedly bang the drum about the benefits of working under the supervision and guidance of a professional financial advisor. Um, both because you want somebody who lives and breathes all this macro stuff, so they have the context. Uh, but they're following the markets on a day-to-day -day basis and making sure that they are, you know, continually uh, iterating their approach based upon the unfolding situation on the ground, but also because they have these models and these plans that they've put in place so that they are making data-based decisions. 
and they're not just being driven by the headline of the day or the freak out factor of the week or whatever. Um, I love the fact that you, you know, you've got such a, uh, a detailed model that takes in so many different inputs um, and you've had it for a long time. So it's very battle tested by this point in time. And that that is what drives your decision making because you're human too, right? You read the same headlines the rest of us do. I'm sure you have your opinions and your gut feels on a daily basis, but you have the discipline of the model that's keeping you honest. That's what kept me, you know, basically bearish through June and July. We had that, you know, everybody was saying, oh, the bear market's over. You know, well, you can be a little cute and maybe sell some of your shorts and buy them back. But, you know, to not believe the BS that you get from the mainstream financial media, you have a model that says, no, 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 look at, look at credit spreads. Look at, the, look at the financial conditions index. Look at these things that are still tightening. They're still showing the stress in the economy. Don't give up and cover your shorts and go long because you're gonna get, you're gonna get killed. And I feel the same way, you know, today or like a week ago when everybody was saying, hey, you know, like, you know, Santa Claus rally, seasonality, Midterm elections, they're always bullish, blah, blah, blah. You know, wait, let's, let, you know, this time, I don't know how many data points they go back. I mean, the midterm elections occur every four years, right? I mean, how many, how many data points do you have to go off of? Right. So, um, and the last one, the last <laughs> midterm election, as I said, wasn't too good for stocks. They dropped 30% between Halloween and, and Christmas. So um, have a good, strong model to deal with. And I, and I want to just, and if I could just end with this one thing I want to say, is that okay. you can't never, end because I have one more question for you, but go ahead. <laughs> well, why don't you ask? And, I'll, and I'll, I want to leave people with one thought that is very important. Okay, great. Um, so my last question was just when it looks to you like the coast is clear, mm. are there any particular assets that you're excited to start buying again? Um, you, you mentioned gold miners, you mentioned dividend paying value stocks. Are there any other sectors or assets out there that you are excited to buy when the valuations are good? Um, I probably wouldn't be very excited to buy defense related stocks too. Um, because I, I, I'm worried about what's going to happen now that Emperor Xi Jinping has strengthened his grip over China and what's going to happen with Taiwan. Um, I think defense stocks could be a great play. You get a dividend there too, but you also have a little bit of safety in case we do, God forbid, go to war. Okay. So, oh, and by the way, that doesn't act, actually contradict owning gold either. So it's, it, it, I, you see where I'm heading. Just I not in time yet, but you see where I'm heading. So gold and defense and some dividends would be wonderful, but not at, not now and not at these prices. Okay. So we'll have you back on this channel as often as you <laughs> want to come back on, Michael. So we'll be able to let you make those audible calls if and as you see these opportunities begin to arise. And that's the value. Again, you, you mentioned it being with a, a, a dynamic advisor who's not a stop clock. So, you know, hey, yeah. You know, I, it just drives me crazy that I, I hear so many retired people, they get the same line from wirehouses. Hey, it always comes back. There's nothing we can do. We can't raise a lot of cash. We can't short stocks. I, I, I actually built my RIA for retirees who have a, I have a lot of IRA money here. I can't short stocks either, but I can buy certain ETFs that go up when the market goes down. It's much easier to make money if you could just go to a prime broker and just short X, Y, Z piece of garbage. Okay, I can't do that. But I have that advantage of being able to go raise massive levels of cash, going into bonds, overweight this, overweight that, and to buy ETFs. So um, I just want to I just want to say this that Adam, um, not only do we have the most hawkish Federal Reserve in the history of the institution, but you had never before had in your life three concurrent asset bubbles. So happening at the same time. You had equities that were 210% of GDP at their high, okay? Never before even imagined to go that high. You had a bubble in equities. You had a bubble in bonds where you had junk bonds trading several hundred basis points lower than what treasuries have historically offered. And you had homes, real estate, the home price to income ratio was much higher in 2000, uh, 2022, the summer of 2022, just passed, than it was in November of 2005, the previous peak. Mm -hmm. So you, you have, that's why when people say, you know, it's going to be a mild recession, there are no excesses. Well, well, outside of the bond, equity, and real estate bubbles that were at massive proportions, outside of that, there were no, you know, um, 
over leveraged conditions in the system. <laughs> Outside of those three most important asset classes that, that, that exist. And, and as you mentioned before, just to underscore, uh, corporate debt as a percentage of GDP, 50%, all-time record high, $10 trillion. Non-financial business debt, record high. There's $3 trillion more of household debt as compared to what was in 2018. Okay, so even though it's down a little bit as a, re a relationship to the economy, historically, household debt to GDP is still very high. And of course, the nation's debt as a percentage of the economy, both in nominal terms and a percentage of the economy, is at an all-time high. Was it thirty-two trillion dollars national debt? So, um, and and people say, "Oh, well, don't worry. It's the, the the government's debt. We don't have to worry." Well, the government doesn't have any money. They have to sell that debt to us now that the Fed isn't buying it anymore. Isn't buying, yeah. So, yet all these things point to the most massive over leveraged triumvirate of bubbles we've ever had. We still have a hawkish Fed. So, please don't misunderstand what I've said so far. I'm saying that I'm not a perma bear, but we still have a lot of downside yet to come, in my opinion. All right. Very well said. If I could sort of encapsulate that, Michael, it sounds like you're telling people, look, assume the crash position, right? Which is we have this parade of horribles that you just did another great job of summarizing there. And so time to really get your, your financial house in order. And I think you would say also like just your life in order for a rough 2023, right? What are the steps we can be taking now to reduce our vulnerability to a number of these shoes that you're saying are likely to drop over the next 12 months? It, it, it's not a message of fear. It's just a message of reality, which is storms coming. You just use the, the hurricane analogy, right? So, you know, the, prepara the preparatory steps you take now pay huge dividends down the road. Um, and I just hear you telling people just, hey, seek safety. And and you know take the responsible steps now to take care of your future step for your future self and those you care about for next year. There's nothing wrong with owning cash, short-term treasuries, dollar shorts. It's not too late to protect yourself. You still have more downside to come. Most important thing is still have your purchasing power, and the majority, if not all or more, of your nest egg in place, ready to go when the bear market consummates. All right. Well, Michael, look, for folks that have really enjoyed this conversation, uh, maybe meeting you for the first time on this video and would like to follow you and your work, uh, maybe talk to you about your services, where should they go? Pentoport.com. So the email is mpento at pentoport.com. There's an info button, a navigation button on the website. Um, and uh, the office number is 732-772-9500. And I'll say, Adam, there's probably a lot of people who have never seen me before because your numbers, I think, are doubling over the past few months. So kudos to you, my friend. You're you're the premier interviewer out there. Your show is beyond uh, beyond par. Well, right. Michael, thank right, you. So um, you are you are one of my absolute favorite people to have these discussions with. And I think everybody who just watched this video understands why. Thank you so much for coming on the program, my friend. And I look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. God bless, Adam. All right. Well, now's the time on the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the recommended financial advisory firms by Wealthion. I'm joined today by Mike Preston. John Lodra is off this week. Um, Mike, another just... Tour de Force uh, interview with Michael Pento. He is such a great interview. Uh, doesn't mince words. Very strong opinion. Um, he talks about uh, next year being a highly likely to be a very painful recession. He sees potential drops in the market. Minimum 30%, could be 50% or even possibly more in certain cases. Uh, really all depends on how bad things break and what the Fed does in response to that. Um, what were some of your key takeaways? Hey, Adam, thanks for having us back. We've got a lot of respect for Michael. He's a, a fellow money manager, um, and he's you know, he, he's been doing this for quite a while. And um, you're right. He doesn't pull any punches. He says it exactly how he sees it. I love that about him. Um, I think that's uh, similar to how I try to communicate it as well. There's really no reason to embellish things or put spin on them when um, – you know, to, to us, the truth is pretty clear. We're in a very risky place. I think Michael agrees with that. He talks about the likelihood for a 30% decline from here in the S&P 500. I wouldn't be surprised to see a 50% decline.
decline or more from here. That would bring us down to around 1900 or or sub 2000 on the S&P. Nobody can predict exactly if it will get there, when it will get there, you know, or, uh, or what the path could look like. But the math says, the models that we follow say that that should happen. And we are past the peak, I think, of the largest bubble we've ever lived through. And, and we're probably nine or 10 months into the largest bear month, the largest bear market of our lifetime. So it's it's really insidious because it doesn't feel like it. And still, everyone is trying to buy the dip or catch the turn in this market, We're trying to catch that infamous Fed pivot that everyone's talking about. We agree with Michael in that the Fed pivot is probably nowhere nearby. He says maybe second quarter 2023. That's not a bad guess. I don't think the Fed's going to pivot until uh, we're feeling a lot more pain and the markets are a lot lower. They really, I don't think, can afford to do that too soon. I think they know that. So they, they, we've had a real scare with inflation. I think there's a lot of political pressure to make sure that that gets taken care of. And I just think that the the Fed pivot is a lot lower in the S&P and even Powell has warned that. You know that, that that they can tolerate more pain, so to speak, before they capitulate on that. So, and, well, there's a lot of parallel thinking too in what Michael talks about and the things that he likes. He talks about his four horsemen uh, that we know pretty well. Uh, it was it was nice to see and, and good to see that he also believes in high quality sovereign bonds. We do too. High quality U.S. bonds on the long side, looking at maybe. Uh, TLT as a proxy for the long-term U.S. bond has been absolutely decimated, down 50% from its all-time high a couple of years ago and down close to 40% this year. He's a believer in the dollar. I think that the dollar is going to stay strong and, and, and uh, it's likely a good place to, to hide and wait for better prices in the S&P. Um, and you know, he also has a short book that he talked about. We also have some short positions as hedges against other areas that we like, for instance, emerging markets, long and um, short S&P as a hedge. So maybe I'll pause there, Adam. There's a lot more to go in in terms of recommendations and when he thinks that maybe we should get more aggressive on the long side, but I'll pause there for a moment. Thanks. Okay. Well, Mike, so you said something I want to dig in with you here, um, which is uh nobody you know could have predicted um you know some of what's going on here um we are entering ter- ter- th- th- that's a territory you head into in-, in a big correction is all these things that nobody could have imagined suddenly become possible um and i i just as you were talking wrote down a couple off the top of my head so um meta facebook um is they just announced this morning that they're going to lay off 11,000 workers. Um, a pretty big cut. It's, I don't know, double, you know, 10, 12 something percent of their workforce. Um, if you look at Meta stock over the year to date, it's down like 70%. So Meta was one of these bulletproof, you know, fang companies at the end of last year that was riding high and nobody ever could have thought that it would be down over 70%. And you know, having to start cutting off limbs the way that it is right now, right? Uh, Twitter, Elon Musk. Hey, nobody would have ever imagined that Elon Musk would have bought Twitter. Um, but Twitter employees would never have imagined at the beginning of the year that there would be a single layoff that would cut half the company in one fell swoop, right? Um, right now, in the housing market, you're beginning to see a number of housing markets around the country that even just at the beginning of this year, we're up double digits from the year before. And nobody could have thought that those markets could start cooling at the extreme way that they are here, right? Nobody nobody at that point was imagining mortgage rates above 7%, right? They were still like in the 3% range at the beginning of the year. Um, we talked a few months, a few weeks back about the, um, the crisis in the UK uh, guilt market, right? Where again, there nobody would have thought that the guilt market in the UK would start freezing up um, the way that it did and require extreme rescue from uh, the Bank of England. Um, and now, on the day that you and I are talking, uh, the crypto complex is just in full meltdown. Um, it has lost, at least at my last check, over $120 billion in the past 36 hours of total market cap. 
Uh, and this has to do with the um, the FTX exchange that's basically, uh, you know, liquidating uh, as we're watching here in real time. But the prices of, of Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and the major cryptos are also getting hit super hard. At last look, Bitcoin was had dropped below 17,000 uh, an ounce, uh, a coin. And again, you know, a year ago, unfathomable to the crypto bulls. So what I want to kind of underscore here is we need to really gird ourselves for the type of future that Michael is, is projecting here, because there's a lot of assumptions that we have right now of surely that couldn't happen here that very well may become possible. And that's obviously, Mike, why you know, I'm such big fans of New Harbor and your guys' uh, hedging strategies that you use, because you're basically trying to provide people with insurance against all those kind of tail risks that we just can't imagine. And you know that's why we buy the insurance. We don't think our house is going to burn down tonight, but we buy the insurance just in case we're wrong, right? So um, I'll hand it back to you here, but... but um, you know, I, I think in the type of market that we're in now, we have to be really careful about our assumptions because a whole lot of things that we just never could have imagined happening now become possible. Yeah, I would say, you know, definition of a bubble, the biggest bubbles we've seen in history are when you don't think anything bad can happen. I mean, sentiment is really good and positive and no one really thinks the party will ever end. And yet, it does. And it creeps in in a very stealthy way. You know, it's interesting you just mentioned some of those bank stocks. I'm looking at some of the charts here. Amazon is trading at 86. It had a high of 188. Amazon's down 50%. You know, you, you mentioned Meta. Meta is actually up 5 or 6% on the, on this news of layoffs. I guess that's a short-term positive for the stock, but it has absolutely been annihilated, like you said. Uh, Netflix is way down. I'm just noticing Tesla at the moment. Trading at 179 versus a tie of 414. That's down well over 50%. So, yeah. You know, and hey, before leaders... you move off that, I, I just want to remind folks of the interview I did a few weeks back with David Trainer on zombie companies, where he made a case, a pretty convincing case, that Tesla could actually be the trigger that sets off the domino of defaults uh, in, in the zombie uh, corporation world, um, largely because there's there's been so much speculation uh, in that world that um, if if Tesla basically starts vaporizing those speculative positions, the contagion factor could be pretty extreme. If you want to uh, listen to his argument there, folks, I'll put up a link to the video here. Sorry to interrupt, Mike, but I just want no to understand problem. that point. I really do believe, I think you might have used the word vapor there. Uh, I, I do believe that there's a lot of kind of just vapor in this market and has been for many years. And it's just amazing how far it's gone on. I don't think the world has ever seen this amount of monetary magic or intervention that we lived through the last 12 to 15 years. And it's it's been really mind-blowing to me how long it's lasted and how far it's gone. Uh, you really couldn't have predicted either the COVID, COVID-19 and the response to that, nearly $7 trillion in monetary and fiscal stimulus in this country alone. And so you know, everything went crazy, housing and art and stocks and used cars, everything. And so it's I don't think we're going to realize just how big and how extreme this was until a few more years go by and we look back in history. But you're starting to see the generals fall, the leaders, and they've fallen a long time ago, in all honesty. Bitcoin, it, it, it really kind of peaked maybe, I guess, around the same time, maybe the S&P did beginning of the year, the end of last year. But Bitcoin is way down. It's trading at close to 16,000 right now. Ethereum is way down. Um a lot of these other stocks, these FANG stocks, have been going down for a long time. And still, the, the old school stocks, the some of the energy and the value stocks and the industrials, they're hanging on a lot better, but they will roll over too. They might, they might hold, they, they might hold up better than some of these, these bubble stocks will overall. But still, when there's a bear market, everything comes down. And so what we're seeing here is pretty classic bear market behavior. And I guess the last thing I would add is very few people seem to believe it still. There doesn't seem to be a lot of recognition of it. And so that's a bearish sign, frankly, because the stages are such that you don't even get a short-term bottom usually until there's a lot of negativity out there. And certainly don't get a long-term bottom until there's a lot of negativity out there for a long time in a classic bear market. And I do think this is, is, is the big one, a classic bear market. Well, and in going through a bear market, 
you know, the investor has to progress through the five stages of grief, right? And the way I hear you saying, Mike, and I agree with you, is we're still largely all stuck in, or, or you know, the, the market on average is stuck in stage one, which is denial, right? Where it's just not willing to accept what it's seeing and it's telling itself the soothing narrative of, well, surely this is almost over and it's going to go back to where it was and this is just an aberration, right? Um, and I've, I've mentioned a couple of times on this program um, what I really fault the Fed for here, which is it kept rates so low and injected so much liquidity for so long that people were pushed out the risk curve and it worked for them for so long that the analog I have is that it was pushing people out onto thinner and thinner ice, but um, the ice hadn't cracked in so long that people began treating it with the confidence of concrete, right? And the danger of that is, is, you know, eventually everybody's out in the center of the, the lake. Uh, and then when it does break, you know, there's nothing standing between them and the lake bottom, right? They just, they, it, you know, they, they instantly drown and, 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 you know, it's game over. Um, and, and I think that's the real danger we have here where, you know, so many people, to your point, Mike, are still living in denial that they're not, they haven't taken steps to protect themselves or hedge or move to cash or whatever. And now that it's happening, they are either denying it or they're beginning to enter into the second stage, which is bargaining, right? Which is, okay, well, look, if I just hold and the market comes back a little bit, then I'll sell, right? Um, and they very well may not get that chance. As we saw earlier in, in the summer, uh, when we had that summer rally, a lot of the people that were were in bargaining um, slipped right back into FOMO, right? You know, it, it, their prayer was answered, but instead of selling, they doubled down and, and went even more along the market, right? So, um, we've created this environment where the vast majority of investors, retail, at least in my opinion, um, are wholly unprepared for what's going on and they're still making the wrong decisions um, at this point in time. Um, all right. So the, the other thing I wanted to flag, I mentioned this briefly to, to Michael, is um, you know, now that now that bonds are creating an alternative to stock, right? Where money can be better treated uh, in the bond market now than the stock market. Um, I think there's there's the danger, the potential and the potential danger of capital to move out of the stock market into bonds um, or capital to move out of the stock market just to the sidelines as more and more investors get nervous about where things are going, where we get into the the danger zone that that Bill Fleckenstein flagged for us about the giant giant mindless robot, right? The passive funds that have been buying largely all these fang stocks and propping up the indices you know the the question has been you know when does that go into reverse because if it goes into reverse we'll see basically the the exact opposite of the movie that we've seen for the past 10 years where the markets just keep going up and up and nothing seems to be able to stop it if that giant mindless robot starts selling those same companies um at volume uh, as capital continues to leave the market, well, then you just get relentless selling wave after relentless selling wave. And it kind of creates an environment that, again, investors can't imagine, but they're just watching the tape drop before their eyes, almost kind of the way a lot of people in crypto have been over the past 36 hours. They're just glued to the tape, not believing what their eyes are telling them. So a pause there, but but do you worry at all about that risk of, of capital leaving the stock market and creating that type of environment? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the Fed and the central banks that follow them have destroyed the free market, really. I mean, they've they've created uh, an incentive, really, to try to, re to 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 go along with the narrative, to play the game. And all these big mindless robots are playing the game, which is, you know, follow the trend, buy the dip. But and it's gone on for years. And, and it's in it. And by the way, with valuations that are double or triple what historical norms are. It's gone on for years and for longer than ever before in history um, that, that we've seen in the past keeping these types of valuation premiums. So it is paid. It is paid to program giant mindless robots or algorithms to do this. And I've got no doubt that they will do the same in reverse. And so, you know, the bear market could be much larger than we think. And, and then, often has us feel like we're preaching the same doom saying tune. You know, we kind of hate being negative all the time or seeming like we are. We're not negative people. We're, we're, we're very optimistic. We're very optimistic that there's going to be more opportunity, that there's going to be freer markets. And, you know, frankly, it has been a few more years longer than I, I uh, than I would have expected. 
Um, but we don't see anything different in the data that would make us feel anything different. So we're just trying to continue to say what we think is right and true based on what we see. And by the way, I looked up the, uh, the stages of grief and uh, in order, there are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. You know, I think that we're maybe somewhere between denial and anger, but frankly, I think we're still in denial. It, it may be in the tail end of it. Anger would probably come if we got another leg lower here in the S&P in that elevator drop that we keep talking about, maybe down to 3,000 or so on the S&P. Then I think we see a little bit of anger. Maybe you got a bounce after that comes back up. Who knows? I'll make up some numbers to 3,200 or 3,400. And then the bargaining comes in. And then it rolls over and, and you go on to the rest of the stages of grief. But the messages were very, very early in this thing. And yes, the robots, they can sell all the way down and they don't care. They don't care about emotions, but individuals do. All right. Well, look, um, you know, it was it was fun to, to to end the conversation with Michael on, you know, what are the things he's excited to buy when the dust from all this settles? Um, and we've talked about this a little bit in the past, Mike. Um, I look forward to talking it about it with you more in the future as we get closer to that state. But for, you know, from the discussion with Michael, it doesn't seem like we're we're at that stage now and we got to figure out how to get from here to there with all of our capital intact. So um, Michael you know, seemed to still be very fully positioned in his four horsemen. Um, that's cash, that's long the US investments that are long the US dollar, that's shorts and that's bonds. And, you know, we talked a lot about how bonds had not performed well this year. And as you said earlier, Mike, you know, it's been one of the worst years uh, for bonds in forever. Um, Michael and I talked a fair amount about how they're now beginning to look really quite relatively attractive. Um, but I'll, uh, basically, I'll let you comment on Michael's current allocation, you know, is his four horsemen allocation. Um, you know, I know that there's a lot of synchronicity between that and how you guys are currently allocated, but what else might you want to add to, to what Michael said about those strategies? We agree with a lot of it. You know, he talked about long-term bonds, high quality long-term bonds. We like them a lot. We were early. We're down on them. Um, but I, but it, I think we're going to get a big bounce in long-term bonds from here as either the, the, the S and P drops hard or becomes well known that we're in a recession or even the fed does some kind of operation twist. I think, um, I think that long-term bonds are in for a, a quite a large bounce, even over the short to medium term. So we like them too. Um, cash, we're big believers in cash. We're you know nearly 50% cash equivalents here. And we'll use that to layer into the market with our hedges as we get uh, pullbacks in the market. We recently did it when we touched 3570 on the S&P. We'll probably look for 3,400, 3,500 minimum to take another little bite long, but that's what that cash is for. You have to keep some in reserve because I think the market could go a lot lower. We could drop right to 3,000 or even 2,800 on the S&P and ultimately a lot lower. So you have to have a plan for what happens if you buy the dip and the dip doesn't bounce. You know, he's got some, some uh, short exposure. We don't have any outright or net short exposure for people, but we do believe in short hedges against and the best way to use them would be to buy an asset that you think is undervalued and then sell uh, an asset that you think is overvalued that hasn't worked that well in the last year or two but for instance we like emerging markets a lot and so we've got a long position there and then we have an offsetting short position in the s p 500 so we agree with him in in that respect i think some of the differences are that He's not in gold miners yet, but he said a lot of good things about um, gold miners, and he's looking probably to get in them soon. We have a pretty core position in gold miners and have had for some time. We have it hedged, so hopefully, and, and we have been able to defray some of the downside, but not all of it. And we've been recently looking at other things like emerging markets, specifically in Latin America, Latin and, and uh, South America, and we recently added a very small position in an ETF that tracks Brazil, which is predominantly energy companies. One last thing I guess I'll note is that there's a pretty noticeable relative strength in oil and energy companies here. And um, we're always looking at that and other commodities to, to maybe increase some exposure on a pullback. We're waiting for a bigger pullback or an opportunity to add there. 
Uh, we're always cautious because we think the S&P is going to take a big tumble. And so we try to be very picky with our entries. So overall, a lot of overlap, a couple differences. But for the most part, I think we, we, we see things mostly the same. Okay. Um, hey, to the point of um, how you have hedged your mining stock positions, um, we've talked about this on and off over the many months on this channel about how you and John and the team at New Harbor use options there as a hedging technique. So, you know, when when, when the average layperson hears options, they generally tend to think about, oh, okay, risky investment, highly speculative. And make no doubt, there are lots of people that are using options in incredibly speculative manners. And if you look at the mania that you know took over with meme stocks and with Tesla, where you had a bunch of people, especially younger, uh, early you know first time investors buying you know tons of Tesla calls, I mean that's just crazy stuff. Um, you guys are very very different. You're using them much more as an insurance play to say, look, we've got a, a sizable position here, and we basically want to buy some insurance. Long and it goes against us, lose a certain amount, and then beyond the insurance from the rest. So think of it almost as like healthcare insurance, where you you have some sort of deductible you pay out of pocket, um, and then beyond that, the insurance covers everything else, right? So you and John um, are putting on an options hedging uh, free webinar next week, right? I believe it's um, uh, it's Monday night. Monday night, uh, November 14th, 7 p.m. Eastern. Do you want to just tell people really briefly what you're going to be talking about there? Yeah, we're going to we're going to go through all of the details of options and how to use them. It's a pretty difficult topic to, to stay concise with uh, because they can be confusing. And there's a million different ways to use options, but we're going to do our best to keep it simple. And we use options in a simple way, a very conservative way. So we're going to be we're going to be covering basic techniques with options. We're, first of all, we're going to define what options are and why they're used, and then we're going to cover some of the basic techniques that we use, like covered call writing and protective puts and callers, which is simply a combination of the two: selling a call option and buying a put option. For some people, even those words will seem new and foreign. So I don't want to go into too much detail, but we're going to go through the definitions. We're going to provide some pretty simple examples of how they're used. We'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages because there are both to them. And we'll try to keep it as simple as we can. We'll use some charts that hopefully will make it easier to understand. Sometimes if you look at a, a graph or a chart of a particular option strategy, it can be easier to understand than just talking about the numbers or throwing some figures into a spreadsheet. So we look forward to it Monday night, seven Eastern. Okay. And, and we're going to have a live Q and a following it. So folks, you know, they'll listen to your presentation, but then they can ask a lots of questions to clarify things. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. We've got a Q and a, it's going to be a good amount of time for Q and a people can ask specific questions and uh, we'd be happy to, to help them. We might even be able to pull up, uh, option quotes live and share them to the screen if we have to and share different charts and, and and give some real examples. None of it, of course, will be direct investment advice, but we're trying to we're, we're trying to educate. We're, we're not going to be able to give specific recommendations on specific stocks or securities, but we'll certainly pull examples up and we'll tell people the things that they should be looking for, what we would be looking for, and how we would pick a certain option or a strategy if we were going to implement it. So. I think that'll be a good thing for people. And um, it's something we know a lot about. We've used options for a lot of years and we're happy to, to share our knowledge. All right, folks. Well, look, if, if you've been interested in learning how to hedge with options, uh, mark your calendars. Uh, again, that's Monday, this coming Monday, November 14th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, don't worry if you can't watch it live. Um, we're going to be basically presenting it over YouTube live, which means that right after the event, uh, it'll be stored as a as a replay video. So you'll be able to watch it anytime afterwards. Uh, the URL to go watch either the live uh, experience itself or go see the replay afterwards is just wealthion.com slash options hedging. All right. Um, with that, Mike, um, I've got one or two other quick uh, free resources to mention for folks, and then we can start wrapping things up here. Um, folks talked a lot with with uh, Michael uh, Pento about 
uh, the odds of coming recession, which Michael pegs near 100 percent, if you remember him saying that. And he thinks it's going to be quite uh, a serious uh, recession with a lot of layoffs. Um, if you haven't already done so, uh, Wealthion has put together a free guide on steps that you can and should take now um, if you work for a paycheck, work for an employer, um, and you think there's a potential at all that you might be victim of a layoff next year. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do now before that happens to decrease your odds of getting laid off or be in a better position in case that happens. And then there's definitely some steps you wanna take immediately following getting the bad news, getting a pink slip. Um, we break all those down in this free guide. It's just at wealthion.com slash layoffs. Um, so go there and download that if you haven't already. Um, and then last, um, we are continuing the practice of me uh, noting my key takeaways from these interviews so that you don't have to furiously take notes when you listen to them. If you want to get my notes from this interview with Michael Pento, uh, just go to wealthion.com slash Adam's notes and you'll find them there for free. Um, all right. Well, as we say every week on this channel, folks, and Michael did a really good job of drumming this home, very tough time. Uh, to you know, safely navigate uh, these very uncertain waters right now. You know, guys like him are still coming in every day, uh, having to make tweaks based upon you know real time changes and the the developments of what's going on. So we highly recommend that you continue to work with a financial advisor who takes into account uh, all the macro issues that we've talked about here. Um, if you've already got a good one, great, stick with them. If not, consider talking for free with no commitment at all. Uh, to one of the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses, um, perhaps even Mike and his team there at New Harbor Financial, uh, to go schedule one of those free, again, no strings attached, no commitment consultations, just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Uh, and if you like to see great guests like Michael Pento on this channel, want him to come back and help us get other great guests of his caliber, please do us a favor and support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Mike, I'm going to let you have the last word here as uh, folks head off uh, into the weekend. Um, I know you're talking to a lot of folks who are probably pretty concerned about what they're seeing in the markets these days. Any parting bits of uh, perspective to leave them with? Uh, you know, just use the bounce that we had recently. If you feel like you've got too much exposure, use the bounce to lighten up equities in particular uh, with bonds. If you have a traditional 60-40 portfolio, that would be 60% stocks, 40% bonds. I probably wouldn't be too worried about trimming the bond portion so much right here, but I'd use the, the recent strength we had in stocks to move yourself down. You know, get from that 60% stocks, if that's where you're at, to maybe down to 40 or 30. And if you don't feel like doing it all at once, do it in chunks. And also really think about buying some gold and silver here, or or even just gold, if you don't have any. We're, we're down around uh, 1600 and change. We had a big reversal last Friday. And you know it seems to be a good price, and it's a good hedge. And it's a good investment in its own right. Um, raise some cash. Raise some cash, which you can get close to 4% now in three-month treasury bills. You can buy them in a brokerage account. You can buy them at Treasury Direct, or you can even buy an exchange-traded fund that owns Treasury bills if you want to. But don't be afraid to sit on cash. There's going to be better opportunities ahead. With, with that, though, I'd say don't worry about it too much. Just do something. Take some small action. Sit back and be patient because it's going to be, it's going to be quite a long ride, I think, over the next year, year and a half. Yeah, we've had a growing number of growing chorus of people appearing on this channel who are saying that patience is going to be one of the best strategies uh, to help out the investor uh, in this world. Okay, um, so two quick things, Mike. Since you mentioned gold and silver, I get a lot of questions from um, you know new viewers to this channel about hey, what, what are the best places or what are the best strategies for buying gold and silver? We have a free guide for that. So if that's something you're interested in, just go to wealthion.com/slash how to buy. And uh, you'll download our free guide that gives you all our recommended instructions for that. Um, and uh, Mike, you had said one other thing that I'm blanking on here. Um, well, I just said, um, you know, hold cash, raise some cash. You can get 4% on three-month treasury oh, bills. Yeah, you can do them in treasury is. direct. You can do them in a brokerage account and, um, and reduce stocks, of course. Great. And th thanks for thanks for reminding me of that. So, um, uh, I've had a number of people say, hey, Adam, we, we, great interview, uh, great videos you put together on how to buy I-bonds. 
we'd love just a general video on how to buy treasury bills, key bills um, through the Treasury Direct platform. So folks, if there's enough interest in that, let me know in the comment section below if that's something you'd like to see. If there is, then I'll make some time and I'll make one of those uh, short how-to videos, um, explainer videos that uh, hopefully will help demystify that for anybody who's got questions. All right, with that, Mike, thanks so much for joining us for yet another week, uh, helping make sense of what's going on here for people. Um, continue to be a very interesting time. The dust is still settling from last night's elections. Well, we didn't talk about that this time, but maybe we can pick that up next week. Um, whatever happens between now and next week, we'll have you and hopefully John back on uh, in a week's time uh, to break it all down for folks. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Adam. I always enjoy it. And thank you for continuing to do these videos. It's a great time. See you soon. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we've put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.